What are the best kept secrets of Natchitoches, Louisiana? Oldest city of the Louisiana Purchase. Are some of the stores in downtown Natchitoches haunted? Who built the stairs in the Church of the Immaculate Conception? What is the Fleur de Lis Walk of Fame? Is there a working cash register from 1917? Did women really sit in front of bulldozers in 1958? Did the Smithsonian feature the Louisiana Sports Hall of Fame building on how did they build that? Let's explore Natchitoches together and learn what makes it so special and exactly what secrets are they hiding. It's no secret that Still Magnolias was filmed in 1989 with Julia Roberts, Dolly Parton, and Sally Fields actually here in Natchitoches. John Wayne also filmed The Horse Soldiers in the late 1950s. So let's head into downtown Natchitoches on Jefferson Street. We're going along the Cane River Lake and we'll get more information about why they call that. And as we go, we see all of the picturesque homes. It's the Leamy House from 1837. Still Magnolia's home actually a bed and breakfast so you can stay there if you'd like. Prudhomme Repair from 1790. These homes are just absolutely gorgeous. Right around the corner we're heading to what's called a pocket park. Our next secret is this pocket park that's dedicated to the ladies of Still Magnolias. Instead of a Hollywood Walk of Flame we have the Natchitoches Fleur de Lis of Fame with Julia Roberts, Sally Field, Dolly Parton, Daryl Hannah, Shirley MacLaine, and Olympia Dukakis. Now this park is right around the corner from the Still Magnolia's home. Still Magnolia's was actually based upon a true story of the playwright's sister. So here's some pictures of the real Still Magnolia's and this is Robert Harling who was the playwright. Now Jefferson Street becomes Front Street and this is the main street of downtown Natchitoches. This is present day Front Street. One side are these shops dating back all the way to the early 1800s and on the other side is the Cane River Lake. In the oldest mercantile store in Louisiana I found some pictures from the 1920s. The cars have changed a little bit. Do you agree? And here we are coming back from the other side. You can see the river over to the side and this is Church Street at Front Street. In 1958 a group of women sat down in front of bulldozers and would not allow the city to overlay the brick pavers that make Front Street so special. The city workers called Governor Earl Long's office and told him we are not going to fool with a bunch of hysterical women and then the workers packed up and went home. Natchitoches is also known as the City of Lights. Why, you ask? I don't see any lights. But in 1926, the city's chief electrician, Max Burdorf, decided to string up some Christmas lights all along Front Street with an eight-foot-tall Christmas star. This actually became a six-week festival of lights that still happens today. It starts in mid-November, and over 300,000 lights along with other Christmas set decorations are placed along the river and Front Street. Named one of the most beautiful small towns in America by House Beautiful, Good Housekeeping, USA Today, Architectural Digest, Cosmopolitan. It's also named one of the best Christmas towns in the US and the third best holiday light show in America. If you are coming to Natchitoches, there are several hotels that are actually by the interstate and inside of Natchitoches itself downtown there are many different hotels also and of course there are plenty of Airbnbs or bed and breakfasts so there's no shortage of places to stay. Here's Casey from the Visitors Information Center. Uh, welcome to Natchitoches. Thank you. We're excited you're here. We're going to start here with uh, St. Denis. So St. Denis um, is actually the man that really creates the cornerstone here in Natchitoches. He is going to uh, establish Fort St. John Baptiste. We have a replication of the original fort. The fort is located right on the left. St. Denis comes up the river. He's sent by the king, of course, of France. And he comes up the river and he gets here. This is, we used to be located along the Red River. But he used to come, when the Red River flowed through this area, um, it was actually a pretty interesting spot right here. 
because along this area there was a huge log jam. Log jam um, becomes known as what's called the Great Raft, and it was a log jam spanning all the way up here, uh, up into Arkansas. No historical fact to back this up, but in some areas, uh, it was a stick that you could walk across the river. When they come up the river, um, they kind of have to stop here. You know, oldest establishment, things like that, 1714. We do beat out New Orleans in one thing, um, and that is that St. Denis um, does come here in 1714. New Orleans is going to be a couple years later. But I like to really point out just how massive the Louisiana Territory was. Um, absolutely huge, and people do not know that most of the time. They do just how many states are included uh, in the territory that we receive um, from France. Um, but it is obvious that it includes the waterways, um, Mississippi River. Um, all the rivers end up draining out the Mississippi. A very important land, um, again, and that is kind of why it gets fought over and tossed around um, throughout its time. Um, everybody wanted us, mm -hmm. um, which is so funny. The French um, struggled to keep people in this region. Um, we do have some, some movement, of course. New Orleans will become um, a huge uh, power. That we are standing in front of, these three homes are going to be the original town homes. We have the Prudhomme home, the Blanchard home, and Docto Square. Some of the main things that are going to stand out about this home, of course, are going to be the iron word. It's like New Orleans. It does look like New Orleans, and I do think we can get there, the connection. Yep. Um, and then also something that really stands out is actually right in front of us is a carriageway. It is in the middle of a home, but it is on the front floor. So if you looked, all these would have been shops, kind of like they are today. Um, and the homes were via. The homes are on the top floor, correct. They would drive through the front and actually be let out in the back. So, and I actually found out, fun fact the other day, that they actually didn't keep the horses in town. And the horses were actually kept out of town, which I thought was really cool. Like, that's so funny to think that you would ride into town, get dropped off, and they'd send the horses back out. It's been a couple things about it being a dance hall at one point. Mm -hmm. uh, so, like, kind of you know, secretive dance hall. You know, that's taboo to be seen you know, dancing. Uh, as well as it was a factory um, during World War II. They made clothing and garments and stuff upstairs as well. And how everything with the um, city of Natchez really grew and blossomed um, spawned from the river. Everything came from the river. And whether that was the uh, plantation home, all that further down river, shipping goods um, into town, and whether that was goods coming from other areas. But once they removed the log jam, um, the river is going to kind of shift past and slowly move. Um, so actually what you're looking at is what we call Cane River lake. As the river moves, of course, we're going to lose flow um, throughout our region here. Over a while, I believe it's the 1920s, they actually dam in both ends. So that's when Cane River becomes a lake. French are going to be the first big influential power here in this area. The Spanish are going to be extremely close, and the Spanish do actually acquire Louisiana for a short period of time. And then we have a great rise of political power. His name was Napoleon beautiful like more gothic style building i love but the building right behind it is going to be what we call the new courthouse it always makes me chuckle it was built in the 1940s but in comparison it is new the yellow brick there are built under fdr's first administration so pretty interesting style contrast i always like pointing those out so since they're right next to each other and they um, were built for the same purpose we have Merci Boku, another um, popular restaurant in the town. They're well known for Church Street salad, um, as well as po' boys and things of that nature, and their gumbo is fantastic. Um, but if you look, it's kind of in an odd shape. That is, it was originally a filling station. If you look across at the Church Street Inn, it's one of the one of the two hotels in town. They have Church Street Inn, and we have. Over 300 years ago, Saint Denis established a trading post here in Natchitoches. Today. They're still shopping, so let's go shopping. The Cafe Frederick General Mercantile is Louisiana's oldest general store and was established in 1863. This store was originally a cotton broker in the 1880s to the mid 20th century. They still have a working cash register from 1917 and they use it for all of their cash sales. We use everything on it, it's fully mechanical, and the only thing we don't use is the receipt paper because they don't make it anymore. 
And we got our elevator over there. Is the elevator working? Yes. yes. That's how we get so, like, upstairs. So, like, I could go use it. You could use it. Okay. You can use it for free. You can use it. Okay. I have to go stairs. They told me I couldn't use the elevator. No. I've tried for a while. They still won't let me. They won't even let you? No. Do I really want to go? It is 131 with no sides. It takes a little over three minutes. With that said, that's not what bothers me. When we step on it to get our boxes in the truck, right. that's coming. Shake a little. Yeah. Yeah, it might be better if you go ahead and use the chairs. Prior to electricity, they used a skylight. The roof is boarding up now, but you can still see the oval opening. From Christmas decorations to pots and pans to barbed wire and horseshoes, there isn't much that this general store does not have. Hello. Hey, how you doing? I'm fine, how are you? Very good. Thank you. Welcome to Hughes Department Store. Did you know that this building is said to be haunted? Workers have reported places where it feels cool, and guests have actually said somebody's asked them if they could help them and they turn around and no one is there. Interesting place to shop. You can see the walls. This was a department store called Hughes from 1827. And the other, you can see the tin on the ceiling. That's where we're going for lunch. Famous meat pie. A visit to Natchitoches is not complete unless you have the famous meat pies. I went over to La Science and had a meat pie that was filled with ground beef, ground pork, onions, peppers, garlic, oil, and it's baked inside of a pastry shell. I also had the crawfish pie. Both of them were absolutely delicious. Highly recommend you to go try this out. So here's the meat pie and the crawfish pie. I'm gonna cut into both of them so you can see what it looks like inside. So this is the meat pie. And it has the ground beef, the pork, and all of the spices in it. And here's the crawfish pie. I wish you could smell and taste this because it was incredible. Look at those crawfish. Very, very good. You have to try it. If you're enjoying this video, please subscribe and click the like button. I have no idea how I was lucky enough to meet Elaine, who is the church docent for the Immaculate Conception. Elaine's family actually was there and helped build St. John Baptist Fort way back in 1714, and her family is continued to live in this area. She told me her grandmother was one of those hysterical women that sat and defied those bulldozers. We're a minor basilica, so whenever the flags are out, the church is open. Because oh, it's considered a that. place of pilgrimage. This is the Church of the Immaculate Conception. And this, the statue of Mary, which is the Immaculate Conception, it was dedicated on December 8, 1892 by Bishop Hillary. The building, uh, this is actually the sixth church in Natchitoches, the Natchitoches area. The first being at the fort. Okay. And there was another one on Front Street. It burned, took half the city with it. Uh, have to, everything was wooden and right. candles and fire, right. so everything burned quite easily. And then another church was built on that same site. It burned. Where... Uh, Right behind this church, where the uh, Church Street Inn is, mm -hmm. was the site of the 1828 church. Okay. The 1828, we call it the 1828 church, it actually burned in 1828. Wow. It didn't burn to the ground. Okay. They still, they were able to repair it enough to still continue to have services there. Mm -hmm. And they did resurrect save some of the pieces mm -hmm. on either side, the side altars, Mary's altar and Joseph's altar. They built like a sarcophagus. With, oh. uh, that was to honor, they came from the 1828 church, okay. so they survived the fire. But it's built like that because 
during Roman times, they would, the Christians would celebrate mass on the tombs of the martyrs, which okay. were sarcophagus <clears throat> like that. Right. So that's why it's in that shape. It was to commemorate. The spiral staircase is very unique in that it has no center support. It doesn't. And there are only, there's only one other surviving staircase like it, and it's in New Mexico. And it was built in the original building phase of this church, which was like between 1857 and 1861. The staircase was actually built. Itinerant carpenter wandered in. Bishop Durier gave him the job of building the staircase. So he built the staircase, and then he disappeared. They never saw him again. That's and then another staircase was built in a church in New Mexico, and it still exists. There's two different versions of the legend. Either it was St. Joseph, who was a carpenter, mm -hmm. or it was Jesus, who was also a carpenter. Right. But neither one of them have a sense. And for the longest time, I don't know if they even figured it out now, they couldn't figure out how it was made how the structure was actually done the way it was done. Bishop Martin was sent from France to be the bishop, and he knew that he couldn't continue to have church in this burned-out right. building. It was, it, he had to do something. So he began construction on his... We were now a uh, diocesan seat, so we had to have a cathedral. Right. So this was the beginning of his church and mm -hmm. he started construction in 1853 and it was partially completed before the civil war but then of course everything stopped because there were no men and there was mm -hmm. no money okay. they built a they walled it in basically to protect had, it because that this wasn't didn't exist okay gotcha uh, and it hadn't been built yet okay and they just had church in the main body of the of okay the church and it which, survived the civil war Oh, yeah, it survived the Civil War. Uh, after the Civil War, when the men started coming back and right. everything, uh, they started opening schools to teach. They had a, a boarding school for boys. They were really, Bishop Martin was really about education, mm -hmm. and he built a number of boys' schools, and his uh, vicar general, Father DeSherry, who's buried on that side of the church. Okay was instrumental. He was like president of the boys' college where mm -hmm. they would educate the boys. The reason he's buried inside the church is because he did so much for this area that when he passed away, they accorded him the honor of being buried inside the church. Which On this side okay. is Bishop Martin, the first okay. bishop. The first bishop. And he's buried in okay. the church. And he also was very well respected. He brought men over from France and trained them as priests and mm -hmm. uh, spread education. He oh. sent the priests out and they educated right. not just the children, but also the parents who were also not able to read or write. But the okay. girls went to Sacred Heart, mm -hmm. which was a convent at Northwestern, run by the Sacred Heart nuns. And they had the boarding school for the girls. And the three columns mm -hmm. that are the representation of, of, that Northwestern uses as their logo now, yeah. those are the three remaining columns from the Bullard Mansion where the nuns had their convent and their boarding school. And it was sold to the state, the uh, Civil War. Yeah. So the nuns had to close the school and move back to New Orleans. And they sold the land to the state, which okay. is where the Northwestern State University started. When that happened... Bishop Martin, mm -hmm. this had been a convent. There had been nuns who had died and they were buried in a little cemetery. Right. And all that. He had the remains removed mm -hmm. and brought over here, and they're buried right outside that wall opposite his uh, grave at his request. He wanted them to be right outside. So there's a, a, a grave outside that has 16 nuns in it. And uh, a lot of them died from yellow fever. This part of the church was built in 1892. The third bishop, Bishop Durier, and the altar was a gift from a friend of his in New Orleans. It's 25 feet tall and it's carved with maybe four woods. When Vatican II happened and they started, the priests started turning and facing the congregation, a lot of the back altars were, were removed because they wanted the front altar. But because of the age of this church and the history of it, we were allowed to keep our 
the main altar. But when they did the front altar, this lamb was actually attached to the front of the back altar. When they restored the church in 1996, they moved the lamb to the front altar so we didn't lose it. We never could find a record that the church had ever been consecrated. They consecrated it in 2010, but they restored it in 1996. 2010, our pastor at that time, Father Shimano, he got a new top for the front altar. Mm -hmm. The marble is from the same quarry. It's Carrera marble from the same quarry where Michelangelo got the marble to do his David. So Michelangelo could come in and carve on it if he wanted to. Bishop Martin imported a lot of this from here, mm -hmm. from France. The throne, this chair right okay. here, that's his personal chair that he brought from France in 1855. It was restored. Bishop Martin was not a tall man. We have his vestments and his crozier. Throne was built for him. It was so short. The priests of today who are much taller, they'd be sitting there and their knees <laughs> because his chair was so short. But Father Cunningham, Father John Cunningham, who is about six foot something, he had the chair restored, had it recovered, and added three inches to the, so that the priest of today could sit in it more comfortably. And being a tall man himself, he knew what it was like to try to sit in it. And my personal favorite were the chandeliers. Red crystal, of course. And you see the red drops that come down that signify they represent the blood and rise. Yeah. I guess back in 18, they hung the church since 1853. Of course, they used to have candles in them, which is how the 1828 church burned. They forgot to blow the candles out and caught a drapery on fire. When Bishop Martin came and he was going to build this, and he knew the history of the three churches before this had burned to the ground, he imported something else from France. They're cast iron, painted to look like marble. Of course, oh. you can tell it's faux paint, but, but uh, hey. it's not wood. It's... It's, he brought cast iron, so his church wouldn't. That doesn't burn. <laughs> if, it, if the roof caught on fire, the rest of it was pretty safe. When they redid the church in 1996, you see the stenciling? The original stenciling was done in the 1890s by friars from, that had a place at Powhatan. And Bishop Bury kind of announced to them, you will come to my church and do my stenciling. So they had to come to the church and do the stenciling. You'll notice not every fleur de lis is perfect. That's how it was originally done. Uh, Bishop Martin brought the candelabra, which are desktoply in need of restoration. And they're so pretty. They're gorgeous. The sanctuary light was hung in 1892. You see the, the little mm -hmm. thing on the staff that looks like a church with a bell in the middle? Yes. That's called a, a tentanabulum. Mm -hmm. Yes, it took me a long time to bring that up and once that's so easy. <laughs> that was a gift from Pope Benedict XVI when he made the Church of the Silica. And on the other side is the Umberlina, which it also signifies that we are a, and that is the, the Basilica's crest. That also signifies that we are a minor basilica. The baptismal font was uh, a gift of the ladies of the church in mm -hmm. 1892. It was restored after the church was restored in 1996. It was restored. As a child, I was baptized in that baptismal font. Aww. But as a child, it had no... I never saw the, the, the top on the top. It right. was gone. It was broken sometime back at the dawn of time. Right. But when they sent it to be restored, the gentleman who restored it had the same exact original mold for the statue, so he remolded it, and it has the exact same statue on the top that it did when it was installed in 1892, and it was imported from France. You'll notice fleur de lis, mm -hmm. and an upside down fleur de lis. Fleur de lis. It's just covered in fleur de lis. You just got to look for it. Stations of the cross were donated to the church again by the ladies in 1896. In 1972, now back then, we still did the church with candles, mm -hmm. you know, gentlemen smoked and all that. The bottom half of these windows actually pulled down. They pulled down and they were little hooks and they had chains and they would hook them to hold them open. Was your air conditioning. Lots of dust, lots of everything. Right. So we sent the Stations of the Cross to a professional restorer mm -hmm. and... Uh, they cleaned them, and when they sent them back, we thought they had sent us the wrong ones because they were so gorgeous. 
we had never <laughs> seen the colors and all right. that. They were just brine. So, uh, and they're really gorgeous sections mm -hmm. of the cross. The, uh, the frames are carved from mahogany. Right. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think they were imported from France. And when they restored the church in 1996, they had pictures, what it looked mm -hmm. like in yeah. 1910, which was like the, when it was finally finished. I can, there were statues that they knew had been here, but they were gone. They didn't know what had happened to them. Right. So they kind of said, anybody ever seen the, has anybody seen these statues? They started getting replies. Oh yeah, my grandmother has that in her garden. Or, oh yeah, I saw that under my mother's bed. You know, they were just going to throw them away so the people took them. The two angels back there that hold the holy water were that story. They were brought back from people who had acquired them when they probably when the 1828 church, and they were restored, and now they're back in the church. Two bells, okay. a big one and a little one. Mm -hmm. uh, the little one is called Josephine. Okay. She was uh, donated by Josephine, I think it's Robin. Okay. And so the bell is named Josephine, but they're not real sure. They don't have a lot of documentation about where that bell actually came from, except that it was stone. But uh, Joseph, the name Josephine is actually engraved in the bell. Oh. The other bell, the bigger bell, which is the one that rings nowadays, and it mm -hmm. still rings. Her name is Marie. Okay. And Marie is engraved. And Marie's history is actually engraved in the side of the bell. And it was foundry in the United States. Okay. Those two bells have been here yeah. over 100 years. 130 That's amazing. Years. If you'll notice, the windows in the body of the church... Mm -hmm. And the ones that have a certain style to them. They have the, the stylized church on the top mm -hmm. and the memoriam at the bottom. Right. But the two angels on either side of the altar are totally different. Different coloring, different style. And that is because those two windows were imported from Austria oh. and actually came up the river in a riverboat. Bishop uh, Durier brought them from Austria. And to think that those came up the river in the riverboat and survived. And survived. And survived. <laughs> All the other windows are American windows. Now, the story of the windows, they were put in between 1910 and 1914. And in order to pay for the windows, are you ready? The windows cost $140 a piece, which in 1810 was a, was lot. a huge amount. Yeah. If you'll notice, the uh, at the bottom of each of them, there is a dedication, mm -hmm. a memoriam. Sometimes it's to a priest from the past. That one was Bishop Martin. I think that one's Bishop Martin. Yeah. That's it. The first one. And then others. This is, remember, I showed you Father uh, Monsignor Andres outside. Mm -hmm. That one was dedicated to him by the children of Mary. That was an organization right. at the school. So it was organizations and families that basically yeah. probably, yeah, in memoriam. It says in memoriam Joseph Henry. Yeah. Uh, Joseph Henry's my great, great, great grandfather. So the family oh. got together and bought that window. And that's J.A. Ducano from Ducano Square. That's okay. his family got those. And uh, that one's for uh, Father DeSherry, uh Bishop Martin's of Virginia. That one was here. That's about all I know. Thank you so much, Elaine, for sharing so much of the history of not only just the church, but also of Natchitoches. Some of Natchitoches secrets have been revealed. Natchitoches truly is something for everyone. The Louisiana Sports Hall of Fame Museum, which is also an architectural wonder and was featured in the Smithsonian's How Did They Build That, is located here in Natchitoches. The copper exterior looks like the shutters on a plantation home. The interior was designed to resemble the flow of the Cane River with curved walls and water flowing. This is the Louisiana Sports Hall of Fame Wall of Honor. In this room, you're also gonna find jerseys, uniforms, and Emmy, a World Series championship ring, signed football helmets, shoes, and just about anything else that is sports related. Even hunters are represented. We've got Phil Robertson's Duck Calls and Grits Grisham. Football, golf, basketball, horse jockeys, race cars, baseball, it's all here. They're all represented and more. 
They even have the pantsuit worn by LSU Lady Tigers head coach, Kim Mulkey. This museum has a secret. It not only has sports, you can also see works of art from Clementine Hunter, possibly the most famous person from this region. Self-taught artist, best known for her American folk art. While I was in Natchitoches, I stayed at the Fairfield Inn and Suites, which is on I-49. If you'd like to see the room, please click on the video link above. Treat yourself to dinner at Mariner's, where you can enjoy a great meal and watch the sunset over Sibley Lake. Sibley Lake is a man-made lake and serves as the city's primary source of drinking water. What secrets did I miss in Natchitoches? Other than the plantation homes, Oakland, Magnolia, and Melrose, along with the holiday wonderland with over 300,000 lights and fireworks every Saturday night from mid-November to the beginning of January. Have you been to Natchitoches, Louisiana? What secrets did I miss? Safe travels!